Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to the post-lunch session, uh, which is going to be on jet formation on small scales. And the first talk will be by Denise Gabuzda on helical magnetic fields associated with AGN jets. Okay, I'll, I'll test it by asking for my magic device. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, can people hear me okay? It sounds like it. All right, I'm, I'm going to be talking about work that my group has done looking for evidence for helical magnetic fields associated with AGN jets. And let me say right from the start that a lot of the, the observations that we're actually uh, working with are testing for the presence of toroidal fields, an azimuthal magnetic field component. And one way to interpret that is that it's one component of a helical magnetic field. Um, and in some cases, there's actually evidence that that's the case. And in some cases, as Robert said, there, there isn't. So it's just something to keep in the back of your, of your mind. OK, a quick outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about Faraday rotation gradients and how they can give us information about helical magnetic fields through the detection of an azimuthal field component. I'll talk about evidence for what I'm calling the return jet magnetic field. And finally, um, intriguing evidence for asymmetries in the azimuthal B fields um, and, and axial currents that we see in jets. So first of all, Faraday rotation and Faraday rotation gradients. Now, many of you may have heard of this, but some of you may not. Faraday rotation is a rotation in the observed plane of polarization that occurs when the electromagnetic wave passes through um, a medium with free electrons and magnetic field, in particular, a magnetic field component along the line of sight. And essentially, this comes about because under these conditions, the right circular polarized and left circular polarized components that make up the wave will have different velocities. And essentially, as they propagate through the medium, they get out of sync, and this causes a rotation in the plane of polarization. Now, one nice thing about this is that the rotation that occurs, this would be the intrinsic polarization angle and the observed polarization angle, and the rotation that occurs is proportional to the wavelength squared. This provides a very nice observational test of whether you actually are seeing the effects of Faraday rotation. Um, this coefficient of the wavelength squared is called the rotation measure. Um, so when you see Rm here and there in the talk, it means a Faraday rotation measure. And that has various physical constants. And then the integral of the electron density times the line of sight magnetic field through the, the um, medium that's causing the Faraday rotation. Now, if we suppose that a jet were to have a helical magnetic field, um, or if you want to think more generally, think in terms of having a toroidal magnetic field component, we should observe a gradient in the Faraday rotation from one side of the jet to the other because of the systematic change in the azimuthal, in the um, line of sight magnetic field. So here, if you imagine a, a sort of a spiral in three-dimensional space coming at you at the bottom, somewhere in the middle, it might be coming neither towards you or away from you, and at the top, it might be going away. You can describe that as a sine or a cosine of an angle, and it's a nice uh, systematic change in that component of the magnetic field along the line of sight across this, this jet. And essentially, that should give rise to a gradient in the observed Faraday rotation due to that systematic change in the line of sight magnetic field. Whoops. OK. Over here is a, a theoretical simulation of this effect, actually trying to do a simulation to form the helical field and then make fake Faraday rotation maps. The contours here are the simulated intensity. And the, the color is showing you the, um, the Faraday rotation. And there is a clear gradient in the colors across the jet. And indeed, there have been a number of reports in the literature of, of claims to have detected such gradients. Here are just three examples. Um, and in, in, the, in all cases, these have been interpreted. They've been for parsec scale jets de de determined with multi-wavelength uh, polarization data with the, the VLBI, the Very Long Baseline Array. And um, in all cases, they were interpreted in terms of providing evidence for a toroidal magnetic field component that may be part of a helical magnetic field. Um, but some concerns were expressed about the reliability because typically uh, the jet structures across are actually quite narrow compared to the resolution that we have. Um, this led to a number of, of uh, actually some very fruitful activity, um, some various simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, some done by uh, Taviki Hovata and her collaborators which essentially made a sort of model fake rotation measure maps 
that did not have any gradients in them and saw how many times did spurious gradients appear just by fluctuations in the data. And uh, fewer than 1% of their runs gave spurious gradients that seemed to have a significance of three sigma, um, even when the jets were observed to be quite narrow. Okay, and that corresponds to the, the bottom plot here, although I don't really expect you to be able to read that. You can see a much nicer version in Talviki's um, paper. And other simulations that were done by my own group, in particular, um, Colin Coughlin and Owen Murphy, did the opposite thing. We, they made simulated maps that did have Faraday rotation gradients across the jets, um, convolved them with various sized beams, and, and saw whether the gradients were visible. And the surprising thing that, that was determined here in these, these simulations, you can see the jet direction, the contours are not shown, but the jet goes straight up. And you can clearly see a gradient in the color Faraday rotation uh, across the jet. And in this case, the jet width was a tenth of the beam size. In this case, it looks, starts to look a little bit wonky, but the jet width is a twentieth of the beam size. So essentially, because polarization is actually a vector quantity, I mean, in terms of those Stokes Q and U parameters that were discussed earlier, uh, they can be positive and negative. Uh, it, it, it is possible to see structures across the jet, even when the jet is quite narrow. So it we, it's not necessary to impose a width limit. We can actually work with far more data than was, was once feared. Um, and the best test of the reliability is that the gradients that you observe are monotonic and that they span a, some, some range along the jet, so it's not just somehow isolating one pixel that happens to have a... Um, a big gradient, and that the rotation measure range spanned uh, exceeds three sigma. Okay. And the Monte Carlo simulations that Talviki took, uh, carried out also demonstrated that the uncertainties that had typically been used for the on-source errors were actually too low in the past, and the values that should be used are roughly a, about a factor of two higher. So w some of the work that we've been doing in my group has been I'm using this, this new means to estimate the uncertainties to go back and verify the significance of previously published results and at the same time search for some new transverse gradients. Now one thing I'll say um, about this, this is a picture that you're almost in the current, in the current paradigm in which paradigm bubble in which we're sitting, the probability of not seeing this, this plot at least once in a conference is virtually zero. Um, it, it was put together by Alan Marsher and it's sort of his view of things. I want to kind of emphasize that. Um, he has a region of helical field here, which is believed to come about, roughly speaking, because of the combination of the rotation of the, the accretion disk and the, the jet outflow. He's got a region around the, the uh, VLBI core here where there's standing shocks and all sorts of things going on. And then he's got a chaotic magnetic field out further. And essentially, what our rotation measure gradient maps are showing is that uh, the, at least part of this initial field seems to persist out into this region beyond the VLBI core. And actually, recent mar modeling by Marsha suggests a picture in which there are both helical or maybe toroidal ordered components and a chaotic turbulent uh, magnetic field component, which is quite nice because the uh, helical component could give you your, the observed rotation measure gradients, and the chaotic component can help you explain very rapid variability. So now, this question of what I'm calling the return field. One of the odd things that has popped up, and, and we now, there are now actually published um, results for four objects and possibly one or two more that are, are tentative that we're investigating, is cases where we see a, a gradient in the rotation measure which reverses. So you see it in one, one place in one part of the, of the source and further out you see it in the opposite direction. This is just a, uh, one of the examples. Um, it's a, it's a very compact structure, but you see this, this reversal in the gradient, and both of the gradients have now been tested using the new error on, uh, estimates and are found to be quite significant. So how can you explain this? I mean, the, the normal picture we have is that you, you have a rotation and you have maybe some initial poloidal field, and it's the combination of the two that tells you what direction is the azimuthal field that results. Um, and so it doesn't really make sense that it should be changing like this. One possibility, if you consider uh, the, the poiloidal field sort of having one orientation towards the center of the accretion disk and another out, uh, further out in the disk, and you can think of this as actually, in some sense, ultimately forming a set of, of loops of magnetic field. If you wind the whole thing up uh, under appropriate circumstances, you may be able to get a sort of an inner region of helical field and an outer region of helical field 
where the azimuthal components are opposite. And if we have emission emitted in the middle of this thing and coming through both regions, it will undergo Faraday rotation in both regions. And depending on whether the inner, the Faraday rotation in the inner region or the outer region is dominant, will determine the, the, um, the actual observed orientation for the observed Faraday rotation gradient. So one of the things that's interesting about this, I'm, I, I'm not saying this is the only explanation for this, but I, I haven't actually found one that is, is different. So please do look for one if, if you can. Um, one of the interesting things about this, if this is the right interpretation, is that you can have various configurations um, of a situation where you have a field going out and then closing further out in the disk. But in order to get this effect, the direction of the azimuthal component for those two components needs to change. So for example, this is a, from a figure from Lyndon Bell, 1996. I just drew arrows, uh, vectors here because um, the arrows are very tiny and you probably can't see them. On the inner, this is a kind of an inner he helix going up like this that has arrows pointing up. And it closes and comes back down like this with a lower pitch angle. And the arrows here are pointing down. So the azimuthal direction is uh, pointing in this direction in both. And you cannot get a reversal depending on which, which one is dominating the Faraday rotation. Whereas if you have a picture something like this, you could. Because here, again, you've got field lines going out and then somehow coming back and like this. And the direction of the azimuthal component is opposite. So if this proves to be the correct explanation for these data, it can actually help place constraints on the magnetic field structure and the boundary conditions for theoretical models. Now, I, I wanted to take some time and talk about what will be a really intriguing event if it actually um, holds up to, to scrutiny. As I said, it's more basically the combination of rotation direction for the accretion disk and the direction of the initial field that's wound up, the initial axial field that's wound up, that determines the resulting azimuthal field direction and therefore the direction of the observed Faraday rotation gradients. And I tried to show that here with a little kind of like a truth table where here's the two directions of rotation. Here's two possible directions of the field, axial field that are wound up. And if you take a combination of, of any two, you can actually determine the direction of the azimuthal component. Here it would be coming at you at the top and going away on the bottom, here also. And in these two combinations, it would be coming at you at the bottom and going away from you at the top. And normally you'd expect sort of equal numbers of all combinations. Now how do we connect this up with the observed Faraday rotation gradients? Well, we can always describe um, the observed gradient as being either clockwise or counterclockwise on the sky. And what I mean by that is that if we imagine the base of the jet being someplace further, further upstream, here's a, the gradient. It goes from um, negative to positive, actually, here. So it's going in that direction. And if I just sort of make that a curved arrow and imagine continuing it around, it's clockwise. Here's a, a, another example. Um, here the gradient is increasing in this direction. And if I imagine making that a curved arrow and going around, it's counterclockwise. And this is just one way to, des to describe the direction of the gradients for jets that are pointing in any direction. OK, so if the direction of the rotation and the direction of the axial field are random and independent, you should get equal numbers of all of these. Um, these two correspond to what we would call clockwise gradients. These two correspond to counterclockwise. Um, and so the, the arrows actually show the directions of the gradients you would get in the Faraday rotation. Um, and that's sort of what you would expect a priori. Um, you can also think about this in terms of the direction of the axial current that would be implied by the um, azimuthal field components that are giving rise to the observed rotation measure gradient, either inward or outward. And if we do this, this is the same uh, little table, but the arrows are showing that this, this type of um, azimuthal field would correspond to an outward current, and these two would be inward. It just gives us a little bit more of a, a physical handle on what might be going on. So what is actually observed? Do we observe equal numbers of these two different types of configurations? Um, we, we currently have actually checked over data for 27 um, Faraday rotation gradients that are either new or were published previously. We found 27 of them that have significances greater than three sigma and are nice and monotonic. 20 of those are what we would call clockwise on the sky, implying an inward current, and seven are counterclockwise on the sky, implying an outward current along the jet. And one way to look at this, the simplest way, is to just imagine 
this as, as being like flipping coins, what's the probability that if you flip the coin 27 times, you would get tw at least 20 heads? Okay? And if you work out that, that probability just using a very, very simple binomial probability distribution, it comes out to about 0.95%, which I believe is about something like 2.5 sigma. Well, no, it's not 3 sigma. But, it, it, you know, is it, is it close enough to 3 sigma to be worth investigating further? I certainly think so. And if it does hold up, um, it, it needs to be explained. Now, I want to emphasize that understanding the origin of this asymmetry, it doesn't need to be something bizarre and mysterious. What it really boils down to is identifying a system of currents and their associated magnetic fields that would give rise to this. And that a, particular, a preference for a particular orientation of the transverse gradients is equivalent to a preferred orientation for the azimuthal field, which corresponds to a particular direction for the axial current, either inward or outward. Okay, and if you think of it this way, it starts to not sound crazy and sound like it might make physical sense. Now, one, the, I'm sure that there are many mechanisms that can produce this. Once, once the, the theoreticians actually decide to get their teeth into this and try, decide they want to try to, to see if you can explain this. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one uh, that I've been sort of working on with, with colleagues. Or at, yeah, I've been working with them on this. They, it's mainly their model. The idea is that if you have charges in the rotating accretion disk, and you can think of it as just an ionized uh, medium and rotating around, and those charges can absorb photons from the central uh, AGN. And those, photon, those um, charges will <coughs> re-radiate the photons' energy that they absorbed isotropically in their own rest frame, but they're moving around in the accretion disk, and to whatever extent is, is brought about by the rotational velocity, that radiation will be beamed in the forward direction of their motion. And then the charges act a little bit like, um, I don't like violent images, but they will behave a little bit like a cannon, you know, shooting out cannonballs when it's on a railway track. They sort of feel a reaction force in the opposite direction. And here's the magnitude of, of that force. Okay, here you see the, the, the um, rotational velocity, how it plays a role. And one of the things that, that appears here is the Thompson cross section, which has uh, an inverse proportionality to the mass squared. This means that this will be much greater force for the electrons than the protons. If we have an ionized accretion disk, the electrons will be retarded more, and the protons will have, on average, a slightly higher velocity, and that should give rise to an electric current in the direction of rotation. So this essentially couples the rotation direction and the axial, axial magnetic field direction. Okay? So that um, the current in the accretion disk provides the initial axial magnetic field that's then wound up. And essentially, it means that that corresponds to these two situations. If you have this direction for um, rotation, you have that direction for the current in the disk, which gives rise to this direction of magnetic field, and you get these two um, preferred. Okay, and the, the resulting azimuthal components for the inner and the outer regions of helical magnetic field, if you imagine the line sort of going out and, and closing and coming back and closing further out in the accretion disk, have specific directions relative to the rotation, and the azimuthal orientation of those two fields is reversed. And this corresponds to a prediction that there should be an inward current near the jet axis and an outward current sort of out here in between the two regions of helical field. Now, if, if this cosmic battery, so-called, is actually operating, it won't be 100% efficient, but if it's actually operating enough to affect a significant amount of the observations that we see, it can explain the predominance of clockwise uh, rotation measure gradients, in other words, inward axial currents that we see in the parsec scale images. If the, it's the inner part of that nested helix structure that usually dominates the overall observed Faraday rotation. Okay? There might be other mechanisms that can do this, and if you're theoretically inclined, please go out and look for them so that we can actually get some, some debate about this. And we're trying to help the situation on the observational side by obtaining results for additional uh, sources that have good, reliable transverse Faraday rotation gradients in order to improve the statistics and see if we, is that 2.5 sigma going to go down to 2 or go up to 3 when we can add more data. And, and simultaneously, we're also searching for significant gradients on larger scales, both um, sort of intermediate, say 100, tens of hundreds of, of parsecs and out to kiloparsecs. Um, we have one example so far. Um, here is, a, I guess, I guess um, this would, is what Robert would call a, a low B FR1 source. Sort of, and no clear hot spots, but, but nice lobes. Okay, and uh, the, the contours are the intensity, and the color is the Faraday rotation. 
And um, you can see there's a, a, actually, a, to my eyes, it was a beautiful gradient across the jet in that direction. And there's actually a region down here that has a significant gradient going across like this. Here are example, just example slices across there. And here are plots um, taking a whole series of parallel slices to see is it only one pixel where it's significant or actually many. This is for the top. You can see there's a, a nice big region in that upper lobe that goes above the three sigma line. And down here, it's not quite such a large region, but there is a large region where the individual gradients going across are at three sigma or are sticking up above. So that implies that, I mean, I would say maybe a helical field component can sometimes survive all the way out to kiloparsec scales. But in any case, I think we certainly have found uh, evidence for an ordered toroidal field component. Mm -hmm. Mm. Oh, good. OK, now one of the intriguing things about this particular object, if it turns out to be uh, to sort of stand the test of time, is that unlike on the, in the VLBI data, we can actually detect something in both jets. And here, uh, you've got it going in this direction, here in this direction. Uh, they're both what I would call counterclockwise, both implying uh, the, a net uh, outward current. Okay. And if you imagine what kind of uh, field structure would you have on both sides and sort of to wind up to get this configuration, it turns out to be sort of dipolar-like, whoops, uh, which I, I depict here. Uh, this is meant to be the direction of rotation, and it's, it's kind of a bit schematic, but it gets across the idea that if you were to take uh, a field that was pointing, say, like a, a south pole here and a north pole there, dipolar-like, and wind it up with the same rotation direction, this is the, the relationship that you should get for the gradients. Um, you should get them sort of uh, both oriented in the same, same orientation, both implying the same direction for the current. OK, so um, to my summary slides, which I hope will leave some time for questions. Um, transverse Faraday rotation gradients can provide direct evidence for helical or toroidal jet magnetic fields. And we've reliably detected these in the VLBI data on parsec scales for 27 uh, AGN so far. And we've required the gradients to be monotonic and the rotation measure differences to be three sigma and to at least spread a little bit of a range along the jet, not just one or two pixels. So this means that maybe a helical field component survives to distances well beyond the VLBI core. Um, or for some reason, uh, it's not a cha completely chaotic field. You may have a toroidal field component. Okay. Uh, observation of reversals in these Faraday rotation gradients along the jet provides evidence, I think, for the, the physical evidence of what you might think of as a return B field that forms a nested helical field structure. And evidence for a predominance of inward axial currents on parsec scales can place constraints on the system of fields and currents in and around the, um, the jet and accretion disk. And it, it may be actually that, that, that this co cosmic battery model predicts that there should actually be a predominance of outward currents on, on the larger scales, and we need more sources to test if that's true. Um, we do have the first detection of reliable rotation measure gradients on kiloparsec scales, it just recently obtained and just recently accepted for publication in um, ANA. And I mean, ultimately, part of the bigger picture, I guess, is that the magnetic fields that are carried out by, outwards by the jets could act as kind of intergalactic seed fields, they ultimately may diffuse into the intergalactic medium where they can then be um, taken up by other matter and amplified in galactic dynamos. And um, I couldn't resist putting in at least one cat slide. Um, this is not my cat, I hasten, hasten to say. And I'd be very glad to, to take on any questions. Thank you, Denise. Questions? Um, there's one. Yes. I have a two questions. The first of all for the you gave the the model for the lead belt and the other the other model for the for the flipping or the uh magnetic field gradient. Models for, for what? For the uh the, the uh, loops? gradient flip. Yeah, okay. Transpass, right. Okay. I, I think that for the Lindenbell model, I think it's so called in the like like uh, in the field of the nuclear fusion, it's a reverse field pinch. Mm. It is uh, actually not only the uh, toroidal, but also the polar field is a reverse. However, there, there is uh, some, uh, there is a uh, force free solution. The so dynamic is uh, stable. On the other hand, the other, the other part is, uh, I think, totally different configuration. Is there yeah. any? I mean, one, one thing about the force, force free um, like solution, yeah. I think that that may actually not give you a reversal in the azimuthal right. component. Right. Yeah. So, so, for example, many, many theoretical 
simulations and things have been done out, done assuming force-free magnetic fields. And if it turns out that that doesn't actually give you the required orientation of the azimuthal components uh, in, in the two regions, then they're not quite as valid so, as so they could. The other question is for the kiloparsecs. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure, is, is it fair to compare that, you know, the upper side is, you compare the, you, you measure the gradient in the, near the end of the lobe. No. On the other hand, the yeah, bottom I'll, side I'll is some intermediate. So it, yeah, okay, so okay, thank to, you very much. I'll yeah. comment on that, comment a couple things on that. One is that Robert quite properly pointed out that um, in many cases you don't actually see the, the asymmetries across the jet that you would expect if you had a poloidal field component. Um, we do have some, some cases on the parsec scales where we think we do see asymmetries and polarization that seem to be consistent with the Faraday rota rotation gradients that we see, but obviously that's, that doesn't seem to be the case here. Um, and that's also another thing is that there's, there's always going to be a turbulent, a disordered component to the field. It's never, it's not, we're not talking about a perfectly ordered toroidal or helical magnetic field. And what seems to be the case is that as you get to the kiloparsec scales, in fact, the ordered component becomes more dominant. So we're essentially seeing a superposition of two components, and, we're, and we've looked at many, many maps in the literature where there is no evidence for these gradients whatsoever, and that's presumably where the ordered component is dominating. And this, this appears to be a source where the, um, the ordered component has sort of been able to peek through the disorder. So that's, it may be that you know, the ordered component, the ordered pattern in the Faraday rotation is superposed with just chaotic, and that that's why it, it happened to peak out here and actually, all, all through here, although this is only about two sigma, but not out there. So there's a question there. Yeah. Uh, so I have uh, two layered questions, but the same motivations. I'll, I'll start with the motivation first. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to set up the simulations of jets interacting with a dense environment, like the, like the wagner bicknell kind of simulations. So the first question is, you mentioned this nice result about uh, observational constraints of this helical uh, ordered field and turbulent field. How far do, they ex do the ordered field last in terms of, say, hundreds of parsecs from the central source? And the second question is, uh, in, in dense environment GPS kind of sources, do you have similar kind of constraints about the field topology, or it's all random field? Yeah, the, um, the, the, the dense uh, the GPS sources are typically very low polarized, right? It's, it's, it's hard to find much polarization, much less polarization at several wavelengths to make the Faraday rotation images. So I, I don't think we have any information like that for the GPS sources. And as far as the, how far out does the ordered component kind of persist, I would, I would say that it's present, uh, it seems to be present in quite a, a substantial chunk of sources on the parsec scales. Like I would say it, it might be 20%, 30%, 40%, something of that order, a sizable number, okay? Um, out on the kiloparsec scales, it's much less. It might be, it might be 2% or something like that. So say beyond 10, 50 parsecs, 100 parsecs, it becomes... what we becomes... need to do is actually look in between on scales of tens to hundreds of parsecs and see what happens there. Okay. And we have a data set that um, where my PhD student is starting to work on that has like 18 to 22 data taken with the VLBA, which should start to probe that. And we can see you know, how, how far out do we actually see, see these gradients. Thanks. Um, so... Um, there have been a few cases of, uh, you know, the polarization angle changing by a few hundred degrees, yep. and it then sort of stops and stays at the same level, mm -hmm. just when the knot seems to have passed the core. It's it's that's the, one interpretation. <laughs> yep. So so in that case, I mean, when you say it, uh, the helical magnetic field goes beyond the core, yeah. Uh, how I mean, is that significant for a significant distance yep. or one one thing to emphasize is that. If you take, actually, let me show you. Well, is it there? You're talking about this picture, right? Um, this, this doesn't show it, but in some of these, some versions of this picture, you'll see what is called a streamline, sort of going around right, right. like that, right? The, 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 these um, blobs that are moving, or shocks or whatever they are, that are moving along there and making these rotations in the optical PA are moving along that streamline. Okay, so it may be that, you know, there is some disruption here. The, the, the helical field component <coughs> survives, but it's weaker. But the, some, some aspects of the basic structure have, have um, been, been disrupted. And it may be why it, it doesn't actually continue as it goes through the core. Okay, thanks. If I, if I... Uh, 
Please do persist. They'll, they'll right get it. You have um, strong uh, magnetic fields in opposite directions in the uh, azimuthal fields. The outside of the jet that's, that's going outward. Yep. Um, wouldn't you observe um, evidence of of a reconnection that would accelerate particles transverse? To the direction of the flow. Okay, of the, the picture, the picture that we, the picture that we have currently in our minds is that you imagine, if you imagine a magnetic field sort of going out, and um, coming coming back in another region, closing further out in the in the accretion disk. So there there could be some physical separation between the two regions of field. Well, you, you that's to, that's the picture. Yeah, and and yes. Yeah, yeah, direction. yeah. That's right. And that that's that's the point. The idea would be that you would have. Um, an inward, an outward magnetic, uh, outward current in that region in between the two that went up and closed and came down this, this, the, um, the center of the jet to form a sort of a closed current loop. That's the sort of configuration that seems to, that, that, that I'm, I at least am thinking of. And you're absolutely right that you, you would have to worry about well, how can you actually put the magnetic field configuration and current configuration to avoid reconnection events that you don't see. And how, what do you do out in the lobes to actually um, avoid some somehow strange reconnection going on out in the lobes? You're absolutely right. Maybe we see that. Uh, jets must die. I mean, somehow. Yeah, and I think that there could well be reconnection going on on the smaller scales. I mean, there's all sorts of variability that we don't really know the origin of. Could well be reconnection. Daniel, I would like to um, disagree with your model because uh, <laughs> I am a bit wondering because nobody has considered instabilities here. I mean, I, I agree you are trying to, to, to have sort of uh, connecting uh, the magnetic field structure starting from the base of the jet to parsec and then kiloparsec scales, uh, and that could be the case. But uh, I mean, there could be local effects also which could produce uh, rotation major gradients, uh, like instabilities. There could be some local instability, like when you are talking about. Uh, the reverse current, especially in 0716, uh, it could be that uh, there is some instability in that region. So I think uh, one one way to check it out. Whoa, 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 Bindu, how does an instability create a systematic azimuthal field direction? We we don't don't uh, uh, expect to see any kind of rotation major gradients over there if there is some sort of instability. I mean, what you need to do is somehow. Take a, if you want to, to, to explain it with instabilities, you've got to be able to start out with a region that doesn't have a systematic azimuthal field component and have the instability make one. No, so what? There, the, there, are, there are people who've talked about things like torsional oscillations in the jets. But no, I may be wrong. So, but what I'm, I'm trying to point out is that it could be that the instability disturbed the magnetic field structure in that region for a while, such that you, we observe that thing. And uh, it could, I mean, the best way, of course, you have studies that, so you could comment on that, uh, is to compare the rotation major, major structures in the jet after a certain period of time, so that we could see that they are persistent there, yeah, or we yeah. do okay, see that's something. that's a very good point. Um, it is something that needs to be done. There are a few objects for which several observations are made, and there are some objects where it's persistent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd just like to make some points about the kiloparsec scale rotation measure structure. Um, the first is that there are ordered fields there. Um, Daria Guidetti's work shows that very nicely. And they seem coherent, but the um, rotation measure gradients are in the orthogonal direction to the one that you're looking at. Um, they're actually along the axis of the source. Um, so, um, uh, and, and they're oh. probably on much larger scales than the ones you're interested in here. This is in Guidetti et al. 2011. The sec so there's that sort of field around. Um, secondly, we know quite a lot about the turbulent component that you were talking about. Um, and you need to be very careful because um, if only a few percent of the sources show structure like that, an isotropic turbulent component can very easily produce, by accident, something that looks like that. Um, and one of the, the hints to that is that you need to look at what's happening in directions other than transverse to the jet. You have to ask, is there a preferred direction in the rotation measure field? And in some cases, I mean, there are quite large gradients along the jet in that source. Um, larger, in fact, I think, than, 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 than transverse. So I, I think this is a, you know, this is a complicated bit of a mess, and I think you need to do simulations to assess the significance of any gradients here. No, we, can, we can certainly try to do that. I mean, this, we're trying to be, to be reasonably careful. Um, 
But, and, and that's why, for example, we're, we're trying not to just say, oh, look, there's, there's one small region here where it shows up. And that's one reason we started making these plots, to show that all inside this box here, that a series of parallel tests across give uh, gradients that are no worse than 2 sigma, and in most, most cases, 3 sigma. And even here, even in here, um, the, the gradients are almost nowhere less than, less than 2 sigma. I mean, if I, if I ran a ruler along the north jet from the blue bit to the green bit, wouldn't I get a big gradient? Right here. Yes, you would. And th these gradients can be telling us various things. They can be telling us about the, the distribution of electrons. They can be telling us about the distribution of um, the line of sight magnetic field. And this is one example. It's worth getting out there. And I, I would love to find 20 more so that we could see if, if they're well, actually We have paddling. published a sample of about 10 of them, so. Pardon? We have published rather a lot of images of Faraday well, rotation. I mean, Dimitri Tristadoulou looked at 85 images in the literature, and this is the one that, that we felt was really the most beautiful and worthy of looking at, so we got hold of the data to see if the gradients were, were significant. Well, I'm sorry, there are far more beam elements per source in 3C31, in 3C449, in the sources that Darren... Yeah, and there may be sources where the, the, the um, chaotic component is dominant, or that there's other factors that are dominating the Faraday rotation, like the distribution of electron density. Absolutely right. Yeah, if you... Toroidal, there's no, hang on, there's no helical field, yeah. um, which we can provide. You know, I've got, I've got a set of simulations which can do this, and we look for rotation measure gradients, and we find some gradients that look like this, that Clearly, that, that, clearly that, can't be the result of helical fields. Yeah, that, that convince that, you that this could be the result of chance. Yes. I think we can do that experiment, kind of. Yeah, that's right. That, that's an experiment that can be done. Right now, I would doubt that that would happen because Taviki has done very similar things on with the VLBI data. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not talking about simulations of. I'm, I'm talking about the simulations of the entire system, including the including the, the, the magnetized intracluster medium, which you need to, which is yeah, 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 yeah okay, Robert's yeah. model, the dominant yeah. source of the Faraday rotation. So if that by accident produces your um, can, can produce occasionally your, your, your yeah. rotation gradient. Yeah, and, it, and you'd have to take a, yeah, take a look at the simulations and see, um, is, it, is it 1 out of 100, is it, is it 10 out of 100, is it 1 out of 500? Yeah. And then we can compare those statistics with how many we, we yeah. seem to see in the observations and see, that's, that's, that would be excellent, mm. actually. Yeah, can be done. Okay, uh, I think we need to move on, so let's thank Denise again.